belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to Jesus. Yeah, we belong. We belong to Jesus Christ. So, show of hands, who came prepared today? <laughs> who came prepared to... To not just hear God's word, but also um, to maybe recite Psalm 23. Okay, we got some great stuff happening. Oh man, that's great. Um, so I want to just kind of, this might be kind of a little bit different uh, than what we're used to today. Um, I want you to know that the things in my ears today are not earrings. Uh, don't be distracted by that. Uh, this is for the Facebook Live, the new technology that we have, and so that's for them to hear. Um, I hope, really, my intention is to make sure that you hear as well. So can you hear? Good, good, great. Um, so we've been in Psalm 23. I see that some people have come prepared today to, to share Psalm 23. But uh, there's one particular person, an in, in, individual, that's come to read it to you other than myself. And so, Eric, would you mind coming on up and, and sharing Psalm 23? Thank you, buddy. For, I appreciate you so much, okay? E Eric, I think Tiffany has it for you. I'm not sure. Do are you ready to recite it, or did you need something in front of you? I need something in front of me. Okay. We're getting it? Okay. So go back to your mom and, and, and grab it there. I, I'm not your mom, but... Well, of course the internet's not... Here we go. Okay. It's coming. It's buffering. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside a quiet beside, beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me the, all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. So today, we're going to focus on one particular word, obviously, it's, it's dwell. Um, we started this whole series, and we're just kind of wrapping it up, and I, it was my hope, I think it's a great way to wrap up this whole series, and, it, and I think it's almost like a, a combination of a lot of things in which David, the psalm writer, kind of comes to this moment in time in which that it just elevates everything that he has said up to this point in time. We begin as recognizing God as our shepherd. And I think that we, uh, we went along this journey and we recognize that uh, we're sheep. Uh, God considers us sheep, right, Jace? How does a sheep go? Okay, thank you. Uh, don't walk in front of me, son. And you'll, you'll get uh, blasted, all right? Um, we're sheep and we can trust God as, as our shepherd that knows exactly what we need. And we get the sense of, there's this Hebrew word, okay? And I love saying it, okay? And so maybe you will too. It's this, this picture, this, this sense of shalom, okay? You like that? Say shalom with me. One, two, three. Shalom. I like to, some people that, that in my circles that, that know like how to, talk Hebrew every once in a while, you'll say shalom on your home, you know, like, so what does that mean? Peace on your, in your home, shalom. And so uh, there's a sense as if that we are sheep and we are laying in green pastures as sheep and we're not, I don't know, every time that I see cattle or livestock or whatever it might be, they're always have their heads down and they're grazing. 
Uh, it's their job. It's their job to graze. It's as if that, that there's a sense that if you're going through green pastures, you're going to stop and you're going to eat because maybe you won't know where the green pastures will happen tomorrow. Maybe you don't know where to fill your, your stomach up in the next hour or so, but if you're in green grass, you're bending your head down. But that's not the picture that we see. We get the, the picture of satisfaction as the, the sheep is laying in green grass. If the sheep are laying down, they're not eating. They're satisfied, their tummies are full, and they know that the shepherd is going to take care of them. But it doesn't just stop just right there. Because the truth is, is that as you lay in green pastures, they know that in the green pastures, there's moments and times in which that you've got to move. You got to get out of the green pastures because green pastures come and go. We're, and I love this that we're in it right now because eventually, uh, obviously, how the weather is today, it's kind of cold. You're going to start seeing the foliage change a little bit. You're going to see uh, the leaves change, and you know that green pastures are not going to be green pastures for long. And here's what the shepherd knows that the sheep don't know is that if the sheep continue to stay, you're going to deplete resources. Shepherd knows what's best. And so sometimes living with God and trusting in God, what that means sometimes is that you've got to move, okay? Sometimes it means is that, and, and, and what I mean by that is that I'm, this is not my resignation letter, okay? And this is not me telling Debbie and Arlen, hey, you're going to get new neighbors soon. But the truth is, is that you cannot stay stagnant is really what it amounts to. Those that stay still in the Lord, those that, that, that not, not still in the Lord, but those that stay idle, those that are not intentional, your green grass is going to wither. And so the shepherd knows. And sometimes it looks like he's going to lead you through the darkest valley. We read this morning in... In Matthew chapter, chapter 6, where it says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have troubles on its own. Jesus looks at you and says, don't worry about tomorrow because you want to know what's going to happen? You know what you're going to face whenever you wake up tomorrow? Trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you to that reality. I really want to wake up to peace, you know? And so whenever we think about shalom and we think about peace, sometimes we think... No anxiety, no worries, heart rate down. Sometimes whenever we think about peace, we tend to think it seems like no anxiety, no worries, no cares. And I often wonder to myself, do you think that's what God thinks of whenever he thinks about shalom? Is, is peace the opposite of cares? Is peace the opposite of concern? Is peace easy? I think sometimes whenever we pray, Lord, I've got this decision, and this is, this is my test, this is my navigation. If I just feel peace about it, then God is in it. And you want to know how it really translates to us sometimes? If I feel peace about it, it means it's the easiest thing to do. Okay, if I stay here in this green grass... I'm experiencing the easiness of it. The truth is, is that the valley is not easy. But God knows what you need to do to experience shalom in your home is to go from green grass to moving you. Do not stay idle. Do Stir up everything that it is within you. To, to put into practice, I'm going to follow the shepherd's voice because I want to know who, who and when he says go. And sometimes it means a little bit of discomfort. Can I, can I propose something to you? Peace sometimes means discomfort. It doesn't necessarily mean easy. Peace does not mean easy. You ever know what, whenever we're in war sometimes as countries, um, what is the war about? To develop peace. Man, my goodness gracious. So I want you to know that first and foremost that there is an enemy after your, your soul. There is somebody that is waging war and knows the, your deficit. 
that knows that whenever you're, you're weak, and sometimes it seems like that enemy of your soul is coming after the very thing that he knows that you're weak about, and you're not experiencing peace. But if you, if you are trying to trust yourself to overcome, if you're trying to trust yourself to overcome that enemy, you're trusting the wrong person. Because what we have went from, from moving through the valley, we know that he's prepared a table for you and we know that goodness is pursuing you. We know that goodness is pursuing you. He's following you. And if we get to the, the last part of Psalm 23, the whole idea is about the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And I think it's been challenging for some of us because we look at our life and we say, do I really lack nothing? Because why is it so, why, why is it that I am in pursuit of something at all times? Why does it feel like that I'm pursuing something in my life? And if we're not pursuing God, Chances are that we're pursuing something that doesn't satisfy us, okay? And so whenever we get to the very end of Psalm 23, and it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right before this, we saw, we saw that goodness is pursuing us, and, and last week we said, if goodness is pursuing you, let him catch you. Sometimes we're pursuing things and which is not in God's will. We, we start looking in the crevices of the valley and we start looking and we find things that is not in God's will. God wants you to keep on moving and, he's tr and you're trusting in him that he's going to protect you. And sometimes it just seems like that we, we think, man, that, that valley or, or that, that pasture that we were laying in, that was the best times in my life. Why am I going through this valley? Why can't I just go back in this? Because the truth be told, as far as faith is concerned, you cannot exercise faith in the valley. You cannot exercise the faith whenever your stomach is full. You cannot exercise faith because what good is faith if all good things are happening to you? And, and for that matter, it might not even be happening to you because the truth be told, you're part of a sheep fold. This is my prayer all the time. God, thank you for being, let me be a shepherd to the sheep and don't let anything bad happen to me. Let bad happen to them because I can come alongside of them. I'm, I'm honest. I'm honest about that because I think that I can go home and lay my head but, uh, and come alongside. But here's what we're called to as sheep of his pasture is to bear other people's burdens as well. So if you are, if you're feeling like that nothing's happened to you, maybe the thing is, maybe you just start need to be, start getting concerned about your brothers and sisters in Christ, because some of you are going through it. I know your stories. Some of you are going through it. And not saying that, that some other people aren't going through it. The truth is, is that they've gone through it, but life scenarios and life circumstances has, has elevated them to the, now they look through the, the lens of the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. My anxiety is not up. I'm concerned, but I have full of faith as I'm walking through this valley because I lack nothing. It's not lack of concern. It's just full of knowledge and full of faith that the shepherd's got me. So we get to this place as we've gone through this journey, as this movement has happened, is because we see this, this future, this now and future verse to say, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, David, as an Old Testament believer in, in a psalm, God was distant. God... God manifested himself in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and it was as if that he was distant. You could, you could approach him through the priest. You had to have some type of mediator. You could, you could come to him, but it seemed like that God was distant. God dwelled in certain places, but some places that you couldn't dwell in. And so it was this reality for David, this futuristic, not yet place to have happen. And so whenever he says dwell or to live in, in that specific place, can you imagine, just imagine with me, where that you're at in your life, that you say, God, come invite me, or come on in, come into my house all the days of my life. 
See, I think that even as Christ followers, we have this temptation as we come to church on Sunday morning, we come with this mentality as I'm going to go meet God today. I'm coming to church today to meet God. Let me tell you what, what a very disappointing life to be upon is thinking that the only time that you can meet with God is whenever the pastor exalts scripture or anything like that. The truth is, and not to diminish this meeting place, because this is highly of importance, but the truth is, is whenever you walk outside these doors, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, God has come to you. You don't have to come to him. This is a very frustrating place to be in if we believe this way. Now, trust me, none of us really intentionally think this way. We don't really live this way. If we could articulate, we say, I've got to get to God. God, if you would just meet me halfway. God, I, I don't sense your presence, but if, if, if you would just come a little bit to me and I come to you, if you would just meet me halfway. We don't necessarily think that way, but we behave that way. We behave as if God is distant and if, if we have to, to somehow go to a certain place or physically or we have to talk to certain people as if that that is the place of God. I think that we have a tendency in the church, um, and this is not a criticism about here, this is just, uh, just being honest with, with myself, is this like, you know, if I go through times of trouble, um, I have a tendency to say, there's certain people that I think that have God's ear a little bit more. And I think that we have a tendency to think that way as well, saying, if, if the pastor knows my concern, or if some spiritual leader knows my concern, if he's got God's ear, so therefore my prayers are, are answered, if I can just get my concern to this person. But here's the truth, is that in God's love and kindness, he meets you where you are. He comes all the way to you. And the truth is, is that he wants to dwell where you are. But I think that, that whenever we look at dwelling with God, dwell in a place of overwhelming security to have a relationship with God, is I'm, I'm gonna tell you the first two years of marriage in my life is that, you know, we did it, I, this is not a knock and I'm, I'm gonna be very careful. I'm just gonna say it. My wife and I did it God's way. We, you know, we didn't play house before that we got married. Um, there was a little bit of like adjusting the home and getting prep, preparation for it, uh, for, for her to move in. But the truth is, is I was living in a particular home for seven years before that my wife came and moved in with me. So the first year of marriage was very, very difficult because it was a bachelor pad. I mean, I had NBA posters hanging up, you know, of all my NBA heroes. You know, um, every room in the house was a shrine to my manhood. And so whenever Cassandra came in, it was almost like that she came in and it was like, okay, where do I put my stuff? No, that's my side of the closet. Oh, you can have, <laughs> you can have this much. I'm telling a lady, I'm telling a lady, you can have this much of the closet. All my stuff is here. It's like she's bringing in, it, it was a sad picture and it was a sad day. She's bringing in uh, luggage into a home and I've, that's already furnished all of my stuff and she's just trying to, trying to cohabitat. It got, it gets really awkward whenever the true conversations start happening. It's just like, listen, am I going to live here or not? I don't want to just cohabitat. I want to live here. I mean, can I adjust a picture frame? Can I move some furniture a little bit the way of my, can I put the right colors on the wall? I mean, black and navy do not mix together. <laughs> there are certain things that just don't go well. And it's a great metaphor for whenever we think about God, we can say, you can cohabitat with my life. I've already got it adjusted. I've already got it set up as far as life is concerned. For you to dwell with me is a different thing than cohabitating with me. Come and adjust. Jesus, I want you to come and adjust to my life. And that is not dwelling together. Dwelling together is, okay, God, I'm opening up my door. I'm allowing you to come in. 
I want you to see something real quick. This is, this is not at all the cadence of, of this, but I want you to see this. This is good, if I don't say so myself. And some, uh, I hate it whenever pastors do that. It's just like, oh, it was good to you, maybe not to me. Revelations 3.20 says this, here I am. And I think that we, I think we live in this right here. And we stay right here. We stay in this green pasture of God knocking, okay? Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, we don't live here. I want to I wanna listen to you from a distance. God, I want you to cohabitat. I want you to be my neighbor. <laughs> But as far as dwelling, I don't want you to adjust the furniture. I don't want you to, I don't want you to repaint the house. I don't, I mean, as far as that dirty pile of clothes that is over there that I know is starting to stink, I don't want to deal with that. But Jesus is like, you know, it's kind of gagging me. And that's the way that it looks like as far as God, as far as Jesus, as far as his concern and how he looks at a sin. So sometimes we want to cohabitate and we like our Jesus the way that we like our Jesus. But Jesus wants to address the tough issues because he wants you to live a life without lack. He doesn't want you to lack anything and he knows what's best. Do we think that he knows what's best? And so we live in this position of, if anyone hears my voice, okay, I heard him, but what am I gonna do about it? And opens the door. What will he do? I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. There's a sense of shalom. There's a sense of peace. There's a sense of, this is awkward. I have to tell you, this is awkward. Jesus, you're addressing the, I, I don't like it that I'm a slob. I don't like it that I've got a dirty home. And if you address it, it would just kill me. And let me tell you, that that's the tension that you felt throughout the entire Old Testament, even to here. And so David lives in this tension where he's saying, and I will one day, I will one day dwell in the house of the Lord. This is what I want to show you. And this is what Jesus did. Oh. He says this, he says in, in John 14, 16 through 17, and I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may, what? Abide, another way, way of dwelling. He will abide. It's not like that, it's not like that what he promised to you is just like it comes and goes every once in a while. We live there, don't we? I'll put him on the shelf and I will get him when I need him. But he's saying he may abide with you forever, all the days of my life. The spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him because we live in the physical as the worldly people. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be where? In you. The promise is being fulfilled. We think that we live in a Psalm 23 world where David has not reached its reality, but it's come. Goodness has pursued you. And here's the truth of you New Testament believers, you that believe in the risen Lord, the one that believes that we are living in Pentecost today, that his spirit has come to you, it pursued you, and the truth is if you look up, it's gonna smack you straight in the face because the day has come today in which that God is gonna dwell in your heart. God has made provisions for you, and it's today, not soon, today. Because here's the truth. Matthew 26, what he did upon the cross 50 through 51. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And what that, what that curtain represents is this distant God. This distant God in which that we cannot dwell with, in which that it, it was, seemed like it was so far and distant that we had to go through another person in order to do that. We have a temptation to live in that moment to where we say, we need somebody else to come between us. But the truth is, is what happens is whenever Jesus, whenever Jesus actually dwells with us is that we are elevated to be in communion with other people. It's not that I have to go to other people for my spiritual needs, it's because he's given you everything that you need, but it, it, you are meant as your cup overflows, you're meant to live with other people with purpose. Without need, 
because you lack nothing. Because what Jesus did upon the cross is that separation now has come to you. Goodness has pursued you and you live in the kingdom of today in which that God can smack you straight in the face. <laughs> and it's a good thing. It's goodness. It's goodness. I don't know if we live in that reality or not. But it calls us to a life that responds in a good manner. It, it calls us to, as God has dwelled within us, it might move us. It might move us to a life that looks like discipleship. Of putting into practice, God lives with me. I want to know this, I want to know this person that seems like that he is very close to me. I don't want to be so distant. I don't want there to be like. I don't want there to be like a moment in time in which that it always seems like I'm at odds with God. I go to bed at night and I give, I give God the cold shoulder. We're always in odd and we're always in conflict with one another. And you want to know how that that sometimes manifests? We don't say it like that, but a lot of time what that manifests itself is like, I am always at odd with you. Because that I'm always at odds with God, I feel like that I'm always at odds with you. Because God calls us as he dwells with us is not a life of isolation. Hey, let's shut this door and let's, let's close the windows and let's just keep this to ourselves. It was meant with a, a, on purpose for your cup to overflow for other people. So a great gauge for that is how is it with your brother and sister? Am I always this sense of, of peace? And let me tell you, this is kind of what happens, okay? We have this coping mechanism as far as shalom goes, this life without lack to say, I can tell you one thing, I would lack a lot less if you were just cut out of my life. And that is an enemy of God because he calls us to be together. And sometimes it looks like because goodness has pursued me, if you and I are at odds, I have to pursue you. Or vice versa. Because isn't it not that the, the goodness and the grace that was extended to us? We've got to respond in a manner in which that reflects the goodness of God. What good is it? What good is it that you lack nothing if you're at odds with your brother and sister? So today, we're going to celebrate together the goodness of God that not only pursues us, but all the way to us. And he's done everything in his power as, as long as it depends upon him. Sorry about this, guys. To make a way for you to have a relationship with him. Nothing that you've done. He's done all the work. It's no. God, you meet me halfway. He's, and Jesus says, I've done you one better. I came all the way to you. You don't have to beg and plead. He's done the work for you. He's come all the way to you. Love has come and love has won. And so the way that we, we celebrate communion today, I've got a few people that is going to help me out. Uh, that I, and so if you guys would like to come, that I've asked you to come help. Um, what we're going to do simply today is that we do have, this is a, a version called intinction. Used to whenever we did this, is it was a, a, a response to where you say, okay, I'm going to come receive it, okay? I'm going to come up because goodness has been following me. But this is a new representation because of what we just heard today. Let's posture ourselves in response to what we just heard today. I'm going to invite you to stand here in a moment. If you would like, you can, you can defer, okay? And what we believe is that we have open communion table. I mean, you don't have to be, a, you don't have to be a, a member of the church. For that matter, you've never, if you've never been baptized, the truth is, is that this was for you as well. If you don't even claim to be Christian, but I would be very careful about this. I would say, if you don't claim to be Christian, and, and then today you say, but I do recognize my need for, for a Savior. 
then I would say, this is for you. The only, the only apprehensive that I would say for you that would say, no, this is not for me, is that if you would say today, I do not need God. I have no need for him. And I would say, then reserve yourself. No questions asked, no anything. But what we're going to do, we're going to invite you to stand where you are and in this posture is that where, where you're standing, we, we're going to usher Christ elements, these means of grace to you as a representation as Christ has come to you. You don't have, you don't have to do a thing except for a receive. In this posture of, of, of revelation that would say, behold, I come and I stand at the door and I knock and if you would just simply open the door, I will come in and I will dwell with them and I will eat with them. <laughs> and in Psalm 23 says, all the days of my life. It's good news. It's great news. And so we're going to invite you to stand to your feet. If you'd like to take communion just by you standing out of your seat, it's a representation of we are going to come to you. And after that you receive the elements, you can be seated, okay?